So congratulations on the album, Daughter. Uh, I've been listening to it, and it sounds like it's a pretty, um, it's a very personal album. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, so, and it's like your first album in four years, and you've kind of formed your own record label um, around it and stuff, so it sounds like lots of stuff has been happening. Do you want to give us a little kind of overview um how you're feeling about the record and what kind of prompted the songs on it? Yeah, I'm really excited about it, uh, especially as a self-release. It's just been way more fun than um, than the other way. But um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I started working on it a couple of years ago and um, uh, pretty much was getting getting it chopped around a little bit. And then when the lockdown hit, I was kind of like, I, I just want to put it up in the internet like today and forget right. about it. <laughs> and I got talked off the ledge a little bit <laughs> to, do, to just do a, a more well-prepared self-release. Right. And, and, and so how do you feel about self-releasing it and being the record label? Is that a, a new thing for you? Yeah, I have a lot of help. So that's been good. Definitely wouldn't be able to get it done by my so nice. but it's it's fun yeah and the, the label is called honey you're gonna be late yes what, what where does that come from <laughs> doesn't sound That's like stacks of... or sun or apple <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i am a wordy wordy asshole but um yeah um it comes from uh just being in the van on tour my band and i will all say like honey you're gonna be late when someone's like running behind and, and right. sort of slowing down the drain <laughs> All righty. Um, so I, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your songwriting process, if, mm -hmm. we, if we can. Yeah. And one thing that seemed distinctive to me about your, your songs is, uh, is that they start out with a very uh, a memorable first line or a thing that sets up the rest of it. And I was wondering if, if that's kind of how you proceed with writing, with coming up with a first line and then taking it from there. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I do a lot of stream of consciousness writing, so, uh -huh. um, that probably helps, but I don't know. Um, I wish I knew more about my own process, but I sort of like <laughs> zone out when I'm, when I'm actually writing. So, um, but yeah, I, I love to write lyrics probably more than the rest of the songwriting process. So that's usually the most important part to me, probably. And are you always writing or do you find that you have to set aside a time and you like, I need to write some songs and sit down and do it? Um, yeah, it's probably more the latter. I mean, I'm always screwing around with ideas, but I try to do morning pages, but I fall off that wagon a lot. Uh -huh. Just the whole three, three pages in the morning. Um, Lately, just because the record's coming out, I, I haven't been really doing anything creative. But, right. But normally, I try to keep the fire stoked. Uh huh. Uh, now, the the, uh, the album starts out with a track called "Dead Writer," <laughs> which mm -hmm. is initially kind of bleak sounding. And uh, the first line I think was something along the lines of uh, "Welcome to my bachelor pad." So yeah. <laughs> is that kind of your introduction for the folks who are going to be checking out this record? <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that song sets the tone. Um, and maybe it's one of the more bummery songs. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically about um, uh, a lot of the writers that I like, like Fred Exley and uh, like Richard Yates, Raymond Carver. They all have this very like um, common theme of like oh my apartment and I got my tumbler of whiskey and my typewriter and right. <laughs> invited my mistress over so I guess it was sort of inspired by that whole vibe and as you, you've kind of gone through quite a bit of personal stuff between the last record and this one as well which obviously in is found in the lyrics of this record do you mind mm -hmm. uh, kind of burying your soul like that <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's kind of my standard way of being is soul bearing, I guess, at least in writing, <laughs> not so much in speaking, but yeah. Right. Like for, for instance, a song like Ringer, it's kind mm -hmm. of, initially you feel like it's upbeat, but then there's like an, a certain anxiousness to it that you feel. Mm -hmm. through it. And then of course there's 
a lyric about dividing up possessions, which is always kind of disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was um, sort of inspired by uh, a sort of a mediation meeting that I had to have where oh boy. Um, it was discussed that my songs were uh, available as something to split. And I like... Oh man! Lost my ever-loving mind. I mean, no, no one would have ever asked for that, but um, it was just a very uh, a, a rude awakening, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <That> was. <laughs> I can understand how that could uh, kind of feel like a slap <laughs> in the face at some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah. Now you recorded the album at in Chicago at uh, the Loft, which is yep. the place run by the guys in Wilco, right? Yes. And what what what's it like up there? I have a visualization in my own head. Oh about yeah, it. it must be a cool place. But it's pretty glorious. Yeah, like it's so inspiring to be in there, and then everyone involved in the in the studio is amazing too. So it's just a really comfortable, really inspiring place to be, <clears throat> with pretty much every instrument you could ever want to play. I can imagine so that helps. And so did that kind of spur you on to try new things as far as instrumental wise when you're making the record? Yeah, I think that was kind of already my intention. Like I had been playing a lot of piano, but I don't think I would have played as much piano on the record possibly, except that when I went there to, you know, do some initial demos, the pianos were also amazing. I was like, why not? <laughs> the lure of the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, <laughs> Yeah, I have a piano here in my place. I don't play myself, but certain people, as soon as they see it, they're just drawn to it. Oh, they yeah. Stay with, you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Um, and you got a couple of guys playing with you, Todd and Jay and George. So tell me yeah. a little bit about them and how you guys work together when you made the record. Yeah, well, um, they've all been with me for a fairly long time. Um, like Todd, for instance, has been in the band for like 10 years now. Ah. And um, on this record, we all were sort of playing all the instruments um, because we were recently without a bass player. Um, so it was kind of all very democratic, like who's going to play the bass on this one? Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, there's lots of keyboards on the record and everyone was sort of involved in that. Um, I don't know, it was, it was probably the most... I keep using the word democratic, the most communal, the most community driven right. within the band record that I've ever done. And uh, being the songwriter that you are, did you find that something you had to get used to sharing like that? Or is it a good feeling to kind of... No, I mean, I, I trust everyone in this band a lot. Like, they don't really have a lot of bad ideas. So I feel like we're all pretty much a team at this point. Right, right, right. <laughs> and the producer is a gentleman by the name of Tom Schick. Mm -hmm. So how did, what, what kind of being a producer could be anything these days. So mm -hmm. what were the, what was it like? <laughs> yeah, he was, you know, recording us and I mean, we're all pretty self-motivated in the studio, uh, but Tom sort of had all the right ideas and the best ear. Um, he was really great to work with because you'd be like, Hey, I have this idea. And he'd be like, is it this? And he had already like done what you were going to say. So he's very intuitive and very, well, that's all right. Um, very uh, dialed in. It's good to find somebody who's on the same wavelength, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, are there any particular, I, I guess one song that we should talk about is a title track daughter, mm -hmm. um, which me being an old guy, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like you're uh, the, my understanding is that the song is from your point of view about how women are kind of looked at and treated and thought of, uh, possibly in a different way than I would have thought of, obviously, because mm -hmm. I'm, so <laughs> elaborate, please. You can do a better job than I can. <laughs> yeah. I mean the whole, I would say the whole overall theme of that song is, um, you know, the old argument that you should treat a woman well because she's somebody's daughter or right. sister or wife or whatever. And, uh, I'm, you know, getting on in years, if you will, which people make fun of me for saying that. But, um, you know, when you get older, when you're a woman, you start thinking about uh, 
your egg depletion or whatever. I mean, not me right. personally, but uh, <laughs> Some it's never us guys don't give a lot of thought to, I can tell <laughs> yeah. you that. <laughs> yeah. Just how uh, motherhood seems to be like the ultimate end goal for uh, people's perspective of what women should do for sure. And, uh, you know, I was actually just going through a divorce instead and like trying to figure out myself. Uh, mm. So I guess that's something I was thinking about. And are there songwriters that you kind of look to for guidance? Um, yeah, I mean, no, I wouldn't feel comfortable naming the people as like, that's what I sound like, but right. yeah, definitely like Prince, someone like that. Um, uh -huh just had a total grasp on melody and and rhythm and you know paul westerberg is one of my favorite songwriters also tommy stinson and um i feel like i've learned a lot from their songs um and then just like country music like you know hank williams right <laughs> and gary stewart like just sad sax right <laughs> <laughs> man <laughs> yeah well it's interesting you know i mean back when i was growing up country music was country music and it was very uncool and nobody was into rock and roll paid any attention to it. but it's it's all come together as one thing now i think these days and mm -hmm. there's no stigma attached to saying i love hank williams or johnny cash or even George yeah Jones, i mean you know? i don't think anything is really off limits now except like maroon five maybe yeah, well, there's always that. <laughs> <laughs> Only band you should be embarrassed to like. No, I'm just kidding. I remember I, I went to see the Rolling Stones uh, a few years back, and Nickelback was opening for them. And I, oh my God! Wow. Like what the heck? Why did what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why I needed to tell you that, but anyway. Uh, um, so what's the plan with the record? I mean, are you going to be able to get out there and promote it or speak, put <laughs> your record not. company hat on now? Yeah, probably not in this, in this country, but, um, and I guess we're not really allowed to go anywhere else. Uh, but you know, we're doing a live stream next week, the night before. Oh, cool. So that'll be probably our one chance to play everything all together in a live Will that be with your band? performance setting. Yes. Oh, cool. So, right. so that's exciting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to, I, there's something keeping me from checking out all these live streams. I feel like it's not right. <laughs> it's just new and unknown. So it's you know. definitely different. I mean, I don't. I I try to stay on top of it because it's obviously, if I would want people to watch mine, I should be watching theirs. Yeah. But and there's been um, some pretty cool artists that were yeah. doing it, like Jason Isbell and Margot Price and all these people. Who yeah, there's really cool stuff. And I, I just kind of like meander my pages. And if someone's doing one, I'll, I'll tune in. I don't really ever sit down and, and plan anything, unfortunately. <laughs> but. And so I would imagine the other thing that's tough, putting out a record and then not being able to go out and play is not having that interaction with fans, people who have heard the music and want to talk to you about it. And, and I would yeah. imagine with these songs, people will want to talk to you about them. Yeah. And seeing people's reactions um, and seeing people, you know, have fun or feel emotional about something that's going to suck to not be able to experience that for sure. Uh -huh. Well, you think it's going to be another four years before you put out your next one or are you kind of, <laughs> no, I hope not. God. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like given all the downtime that I have, once I get this this record out, it's probably going to be back to the grind just because I'll have to keep myself entertained somehow. <laughs> There's a lot of that <laughs> going on. Yeah. <laughs> I spend all my time talking to folks like you. It's just incredible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so worst things could happen. But uh I'm glad, I'm glad we finally hooked up and uh, got to talk yeah. about this. And I'm glad I got to hear the record because it's, it, it's fantastic. And yeah, hopefully it you. does well. I don't know what it's going to do because I don't know what that even means anymore. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> there you go. But uh, enjoy your time in North Carolina. Hopefully stay Thank safe you. and stay cool. And uh, try and come down to New Zealand sometime and play for yeah, us. Yeah, hopefully. You just have to sit in quarantine for two weeks first. <laughs> <laughs> I can handle it. I'm sure. All right. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.